has been prepared for everybody to toast the new session of the new Austrian school. So let's give uh, Ludwig and uh, Willie a round of applause for organizing this. And especially for uh, starting off the day with a little bit of uh, alcoholic refreshment. <laughs> That is the sound of the cork, <laughs> recognizable around the world without language translations. Start with this. It's it's in there okay. at the very beginning. Lecture one. Just two pages for title. We'll fill fill in the hour. Ah, thank you. so bold. The world needs a scientific and methodical approach to the study of money and credit. And the professor has been working uh, a long, lonely road to produce this body of ideas, which now have reached the point where they can no longer be ignored or suppressed. I've noticed the growth of the school since, since I began in 2009, and I would say there's about a 50% growth probably thanks to Ludwig and Willi uh, since uh, Munich in August. So to the growth of the ideas of the professor. Thank you, Keith. Cheers. 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 So the professor is going to begin. Appropriately enough, uh, the first lecture is going to be on the origins of money and interest. So with that, I turn it over to the professor. Thank you very much. 
uh, my comments are in your folder. Just go to the, at the very beginning after the map of Munich there is lecture one so for those who find it easier to follow that's how I start <coughs> I have to expand on this a little bit but what my purpose here is to call attention to the fact that two quite different and seemingly unrelated theories are actually intimately connected. One is the, the, uh, the theory of the origin of money and the other is the theory of origin of interest. So I start by pointing out to you that the greatest word in economic science is this German word, Absatzfähigkeit, which in English is commonly translated as marketability. That word did not exist in German or in any other language before Karl Menger introduced it. You probably know by now that our hero in this new Austrian school of economics is Karl Menger. Karl spelled with a C, because there's also a Karl Menger spelled with a K. Now, Karl with a C is the father, and Karl with a K is the son. And uh, they cooperated in later life of the father, and unfortunately this cooperation didn't bring the result. Because the father did create the theory of origin of money. That you find in his <coughs> 1971 uh, treatise uh, Grundsatze der Volkswirtschaftslehre. In English, it was trans into English, they translated only 80 years after that with the title Principles of Economics. It's a slender volume, but very deep, and one of the highlights is the theory of the origin of money. So I would like to uh, review this theory before I go on to discuss the theory of origin of interest, which is, you don't find in the published work of Karl Menger, because I think he ran out of time. He died at the ripe old age of 81, but I think he would have written it, because all is there, the same method methodology, the same uh, forceful argument, they are all applicable to interest as well. And uh, one of the things which I take pride is that I spotted that similarity between the two theories and I worked out the theory of origin of interest in the spirit of Karl Menger, which I consider one of the greatest uh, geniuses in human history. As you know, in Westminster Abbey, where uh, Isaac Newton's tomb is, he is buried there, there is a marble statue and with the inscription, Humanis generis decus, 
in Latin, which in English means the uh, pride of the human race. Well, I, I'm suggesting it to you that with just as much justification, we can give that epithet, epithet to Karl Menger as well. Humanis generis decus. The pride of human race, Karl Menger. So, as I said, Absatzfähigkeit is the most important word in all economics, means marketability, and you will find it everywhere in the modern subjective economics. You won't find it in mainstream economics or neoclassical economics or wherever equilibrium is put in the center. Absatzfähigkeit is the, is the denial of equilibrium. Menger's theories are all this equilibrium theories. This word, Absatzfähigkeit, suggests to you the absence of equilibrium. So this is what Menger did in developing his theory of the origin of money. He started from condition of barter. It's a barter economy. You go to the market, you have some surpluses. You can think of wheat, for example, but really anything else. And you need something else just to fix our ideas. Let's assume that you need um, you need uh, suggest something. Corn? No, uh, chicken. Chicken. <laughs> Very good. All right. So you have a problem of finding somebody who has the chicken <coughs> and needs wheat. Okay? But this is reducing your possibility of finding a matching partner. And this is a very great handicap if you come to think of it. And it just so happened long, long, long time ago that the smart traders came to hit upon an idea. The idea was that they should not look for another partner with chicken because that's limiting your chances just too much. And you waste a lot of effort and time and uh, <clears throat> you, may, you may miss the chance. You are better off to find a partner who has something which is more marketable than what you have, which is wheat. Okay? So this was an idea which developed over the period of time. The smartest traders, they did not start looking for ch chicken if, they, if that's what they wanted. They started looking for something which is more marketable than what they had to give away in barter, what their surplus was. And therefore, it was in terms of marketability that a process started. It's an evolutionary process, whereby the smart traders immediately acted and getting rid of their surpluses against something which is more marketable than what they had. Of course, you have to have an insight what is more marketable, but these were experienced traders and they knew, knew very well when they saw that this is more marketable. And 
they made the exchange. And then they had to make a second exchange, use this more marketable good and offer it to somebody who had the chicken, which was their final goal, to get chicken. Okay? So in other words, the one single transaction of swap, trading wheat for chicken, was broken up into two transaction, seemingly something more complicated, but it was a great simplification. Because one was what we could call a sale. When you exchange your surplus for something more marketable, that could be called a sale. And the second is a purchase. When you have something which is more marketable and you want a definite commodity, in that case chicken, then you make a second transaction and that's the purchase. So the barter was broken up into two legs, if you will. One is a sale and the other is a purchase. There's still no money, remember, this is still barter, strictly speaking. But the, little by little the idea of a sale and a purchase and the distinction between these two types of barters emerges and it took long time. Don't think that this was an invention like inventing the sewing machine or something like that. This was an evolution and first just one or a couple of traders came to this idea and then they got imitators and then more and more people realized that these guys got the right idea and they started following that. <coughs> and then what this meant was that a search for the most marketable good was on. Because what we see here is that all the commodities which are offered in exchange are actually uh, qualified by a degree of marketability. There is one which is marginally more marketable, another one which is even more, and another one which is even more marketable. So there is a whole spectrum of commodities representing different degrees of marketability. But the name of the game is quite clear. You want the most marketable good. And obviously there is going to be one. If you, you don't have it already, it's just a matter of recognizing it, but if you don't have it already, then the development the evolution will produce it because there is a rush into searching for the most marketable uh, commodity. And as it turns out, this most marketable commodity is gold or perhaps silver as well, the two of them. Maybe simultaneously, maybe one after the other. We don't know. These things happen before writing and record taking was invented. There's no written record of this. We just don't know when and how and how long it took. We just don't know. Completely, we are completely ignorant about that. But anyhow, in, uh, according to Menger's theory of the origin of money, it must have happened. There's no other way. It could, it could have taken a thousand years, could have taken shorter, could have taken longer, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is that ultimately there was a snowballing effect. A, a commodity was suspected to be most marketable, and then as more and more traders were looking for it, the marketability of this commodity snowballed got 
it got even more marketable and even more mar marketable after that. And ultimately, it was towering in the degree of marketability, it was towering over all other possible competitors. So this process came to an end when the market hit upon the two, gold and silver. And the race was over. And this is how gold and silver became money. And this is, in a nutshell, the theory of the origin of money, as described by Karl Menger. And very closely connected with this idea of the evolution of money is, and also follow, flowing directly from the concept of Absatzfähigkeit, is the fact that the market <coughs> quotes not one price, but two prices. A very great breakthrough in economic thought, bypassing hundreds and hundreds of years of study. Because up until that point, when Menger came up with that idea, it was assumed that there is only one monolithic price, which is the equilibrium price. The supply and demand, and uh, in the market, uh, supply meets demand, and through a number of exchanges, an equilibrium price is solidified, and that becomes the monolithic uh, market price. Menger said, no, this is an abstraction which is not even close to what is happening in reality. Because what is happening in reality is that there's no such thing as supply and demand. These are abstractions which do not correspond very faithfully to the facts. In fact, he said, uh, supply and demand is a much vaguer idea. Perhaps a more modern example will make it clear. Take a speculator in agricultural commodities. And you would like to classify him. Is he a buyer? Is he a seller? Is he contrib contributing to supply? or perhaps he is contributing to demand. The last demand, are you a supplier or are you coming up with a demand for, say, wheat? And the man, if he is sincere, he will say, you know something? I don't know myself. It depends. And if I'm a seller now, I may change my mind in a second if I see that uh, if I see on the newswire that there was a blight of corn somewhere in the world, which means uh, a big reduction in the supply. I become a buyer, so I don't know. It depends. And. If you realize that a large part of the market participants are such speculators, then you will immediately see that really that is true. There is no rigid monolithic supply and rigid monolithic demand. Because I, I've read it somewhere, Keith, that uh, take wheat, for example. The number of times wheat exchanges hands in trade before it reaches the uh, flour mill and the baker and the ultimate consumer. Before that happens, <coughs> wheat could be exchanged thousands of times 
but 99% of those transactions are taking place in the futures market. Something like that. This is a fair statement, right? Can you add something to it? There's, there's a lot of scandal. I'm sure most of the people in this room are aware of the uh, number of trades of gold relative to the number of physical bars held in London. And people take this as evidence that there's fraud, but there's nothing wrong with me selling something to somebody else who sells it to somebody else who sells it to somebody else. There's no particular limit to that as long as there's a willing buyer and a willing seller. So all this goes to show that supply and demand are very questionable concepts. But you still have to explain how prices are formed. And Menger's answer is this. Give up the idea of a monolithic price, equilibrium price, because that's a red herring. It leads you astray. It does not give you the real insight, what's happening. What is really happening, he says, is that there are people who come with an intention to buy and there are people who come with an intention to sell and the market will come up with two prices instead of one. Two. One is the asked price, some in the, in the British parlance, it's, it's called the offer, right? The offer. The offer. But uh, in North America, more commonly, I think it's called the ask price. And opposite to that is the lower bid price. And if you don't want to haggle about the price at which you buy or at which you sell, then if you are a buyer, you take the ask price and you can buy as much as you want at the ask price, which is strictly not true because the ask price itself is subject to change depending how big the order is. But uh, roughly speaking, if you don't want to haggle, you just take the ask price and then you can buy. Or if you are a seller and you don't want to haggle, then you take the bid price. And then that bid price you can sell your supply. So that is actually a range with the lower limit being the bid price and the upper limit being the ask price. By the way, how do we know that the ask price is always higher than the bid price and no exception can ever occur? How do we know that? Well, we know that because nobody in his right price would pay a higher price than the asked price. Right. So th th there's no question about that, that the asked price is always high. Cannot even be equal. Maybe there are exceptional circumstances, but that should, uh, the market should eliminate these uh, exceptions. and. Typically, we are on very safe grounds to say that the ask price is the upper limit, bid price is the lower limit of the range in which the actual exchange price varies. And these two are more or less fixed relative to the actual exchange price. And it's a very interesting question to ask and study. What are the forces which form the bid price? And it's an entirely separate question to ask and study. What are the forces which form the ask price? You see? So that is what Menger did. What this, this, this single little word, Absatzfähigkeit, suggests a whole new theory and a whole new approach to economics which has no resemblance to the previous uh, economic thought and certainly no re <laughs> resemblance to what happened after which is 
mainstream economics, which would completely sweep these ideas aside and uh, follow its own way, the macroeconomics. So there it is, this is the uh, fact that you always have to look for a pair of prices rather than a single price if you want to understand what the market is doing.